Uh, let's jump into the series recap. What have we learned so far? Well, in week one, we looked at Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11 is this great chapter about faith. And in the first three verses, we get a great explanation of faith. And how I summed up that explanation of faith that the writer of Hebrews gives, I said it this way, that faith makes eternal truth more real to us than what we see and feel. And how many of you would agree we are seeing and feeling a lot of things these days? We are seeing injustice. We're seeing political craziness. We're seeing fights within the church. We're seeing uh, division. We're seeing fires. We're seeing a lot of things that have an impact on our feelings and have an impact on our faith. And what the writer of Hebrews says, and, and in my summary, it's faith makes eternal truth more real. Faith gives substance to the things that are unseen. It makes eternal truth more real. And so that's what we learned in week one. And then last week, uh, we took a look at the first biblical character to actually exercise faith. Uh, Adam and Eve's son, Abel. And this is what we learned about Abel's faith last week. What we saw was that Abel lived by faith because obedience was more real. He gave more substance to obeying God in how he sacrificed um, than personal preference. And that's what Cain did. Instead of giving to God what God asked for, Cain went his own way. He gave fruit And so last week's big idea is that for our worship to be acceptable to God, it has to be done in obedience, in obedience. And so obedience is a big part of a life of faith. And so today we get to look at a second character study, a second character. And once again, his name is Enoch. We're going to look at Enoch's faith. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the passage again. I'm going to actually read it in two different versions just to uh, wrap our heads around it a little bit more. And then we're going to actually get into the Genesis account. Just like we got into the Genesis account of Cain and Abel, we're going to go into the Genesis account of Enoch uh, to understand his life a little bit better before we connect it to our faith. And so let's jump back into the Hebrews text and let's see what we can learn about Enoch's faith. And once again, we're learning about Enoch's faith so we can have a faith that's biblical, so that we can have a faith that gives more substance to eternal truths than the things we see and feel. And so if you have any interest at all in not being led by your feelings and not being led by the things you see, But being led by the eternal truths of God's word, Enoch's life and his story is going to help us with that. So let's take a look again. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Hebrews 11.6 says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. A very popular verse. There it is right in the middle of Enoch's story. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So that's the English standard version. Let's take a look at the new or the message translation um, for another translation of this passage. By an act of faith. Enoch skipped death completely. Gotta love Eugene Peterson. Skipped death completely. They looked all over and couldn't find him because God had taken him. We know on the basis of reliable testimony that before he was taken, he pleased God. The message translation continues. It says, it's impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he exists, and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. So as we go a little bit deeper to try to understand this passage and what it has to do with our lives and what it means for our faith, here are two questions that we're going to ask. So what's Enoch's story? 
Is there any more to it than what we read there in Hebrews? I mean, this idea of him just being taken up, what, what is that all about? And then, because you saw it a couple times, Enoch pleased God. He pleased God. So what did he do that pleased God so much? And we find Enoch's story in Genesis 5, in Genesis 5. And just so you know, if you look at the context of Genesis 5, it's, it's one of those genealogies, lists a lot of names of Old Testament characters from Adam and Eve on down. And every line after the person and how long they lived, it says, and he died, and he died, and he died. But look what happens when we get to Enoch. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Everyone say Methuselah. That's just a fun name. And I, I, I learned this growing up in church. Methuselah is a character you got to know because if you ever have the Bible trivia question, who is the oldest man to have ever lived, oldest Bible uh, character to have ever lived, it would be Methuselah. And if my memory serves me correctly, I believe he lived to 969 years old. You might have to do a a political fact check on that one. Come on, somebody, fact check me. 969 years old, Enoch was the father of the oldest man to have ever lived 969 years old. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He didn't die because God took him. Now, uh, that is the English Standard Version translation of the text. Let me take you to the message translation of the same portion of Scripture just to see how Eugene Peterson paraphrases this passage. He says it this way. When Enoch was 65 years old, he had Methuselah. Enoch walked steadily with God. After he had Methuselah, he lived another 300 years, having more sons and daughters. Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked steadily with God. And then one day, he was simply gone. I love that. One day, he vanished. They couldn't find him. He was gone. Why? God took him. God took him. I believe there are only two Bible characters we're in, in this work of antiquity, as we study the Old Testament and the New Testament, only two characters other than Jesus who, who did not experience a, a physical death. Jesus experienced a physical death. He was raised to life. Who did not experience a physical death. Uh, and I believe it's, it's Enoch and, and I think it was either, I think it's Elijah or Elisha. I'm not sure which one, but it's one of those. Fact check me. Put it in the comments. You'll figure it out. But God took him. And so the first question was, what was Enoch's story? And as you can see, there's really not much here, but just in case you missed it, just in case you fell asleep, okay, here's Enoch's story. Enoch had Methuselah. He lived 365 years. He walked with God. He never died because God took him. So, um, and then the next question I have here, right, that's Enoch's story. So how did Enoch please God? I don't know about you, but there's nothing really in that text that shows us how he pleased God. I mean, you saw there one translation said he walked with God. Another translation said he walked steadily with God. And, and really, if you look into those terms in the Old Testament Hebrew, those words really mean he pleased God. How did he not please God? He, he pleased God. So Actually, I took you into Genesis just so you could see what we know about Enoch. There's also, just so you know, there's also another portion of scripture. It's actually in the New Testament book of Jude where Enoch uh, prophesies. So Jude, the writer of the book of Jude, knew this prophecy that Enoch had given back when he had lived and he's talking about the judgment of God, but outside of the Genesis account, the Hebrews account, and this portion of the book of Jude, where Enoch basically talks about the judgment of God, we don't really know much else about him. And so kind of like last week with Abel, you don't really 
find out about Abel primarily through the story in Genesis in terms of why he pleased God or why he lived by faith or what made Abel's offering acceptable. What we did last week is actually we just looked closely, more closely at the book of Hebrews to find what it is that Abel did. And that's what we're going to do to find out how Enoch pleased God. We're just going to take a closer look at the Hebrews account. So let's go back into it. He was taken up. So he should not see death. He was not found because God took him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Now, how did he please God? Well, the key is actually in the next passage, the next scripture. First, this general statement is made, without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek them. So before I talk about how um, Enoch, please God, let me just make this point because this is in blue. That means it's super important. You need to know this. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So let me just summarize that thought real quickly here. When God is not believed, God is not pleased. When we don't believe God, he's not pleased with us. When you don't believe God, God is not pleased with you. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. The prerequisite for the pleasure of God is faith in God. The prerequisite for the pleasure of God is faith in God. Do you want to please God? Come on, in the comments. Yes, I want to please God. If you want to please God, we must have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Okay, so... The question is, how did Enoch please God? Well, he had faith. Do you have anything else for us, Ed? Yes. Let's jump back into the text. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. A faith that pleases God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We're moving right along here. If I was to summarize Enoch's faith, here's what I would say. Enoch pleased God because he believed God existed and he believed God rewarded. This is the interpretation of the text here. How did Enoch please God? Well, the scripture says it is impossible to please God without faith and whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek after him. And so if Enoch lived by faith, that's what it says, by faith he was taken up. If he lived by faith, if we look deeper in at Enoch's faith, he had a faith that believed that God existed and he believed God rewarded. It's just a simple thought. It's a simple thought. Now, let's go right into the tie into our faith. Let's keep this moving. What is the tie-in to our faith? Two questions. One, do you believe God exists? And two, do you believe God rewards? Wow, Ed, this is so elementary. Okay, I know. But let me just ask you, do you believe God exists? Do you believe that before the beginning of time, he was the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end? Do you believe God exists? Do you believe he created everything else that exists? And for many of you, many people who I'm talking to today, members of the Movement Church family, and even if you're a guest checking us out, very likely you believe God exists. And I'm so thankful that you believe God exists. Not going to spend too much time today convincing you of the existence of God. If you're here today and you're not convinced that he exists, definitely, man, put that in the chat. Let us know. Hey, I wish you would have spent more time on this first one because I don't believe he exists. We'd love to have conversations with you about the existence of God. What I want to spend some time talking about today is whether or not you believe that God rewards. As I studied this passage and found that Enoch believed and had a faith that believed that God rewards. I just thought to myself, I don't know if I see God as a rewarder. And I would just ask you, 
Do you see God as one who rewards? Because the scripture says he rewards those who diligently seek after him. And so for the balance of my time today, I'm going to talk about the rewarding nature of God. And I've just got to tell you, because I've felt it, so many of my messages have been over the last several weeks, several months, or maybe just the entirety of my preaching career at the movement. I, I oftentimes really get into your sin and the ways in which you don't have faith and the ways in which you still need to make progress. And I don't know, that's just how God wired me to challenge you in all those ways. But I'm so glad. Come on, somebody. Maybe you could just relax a little bit today. Just relax, because I know many times when you listen to me, you're just waiting to feel the conviction of God, okay? And, and not to say, not to say that there's going to be no conviction in today's message, but how many of you are excited, maybe you'll put in the comments, that today we're going to explore the characteristic of God as a rewarder. How many of you like rewards? Come on, somebody. You like to be rewarded. And maybe some of you are even thinking, I, I don't know. And so before we look at God as a rewarder, let me just put up a list of many of the ways that we do how we do see God, how we do identify with God. And I'd love for you to interact, just a few of you, or as many of you who would like to in the comments. How do you primarily identify with God? How do you see God? Heavenly Father, he's your Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, I see him as Father, or Lord and King, he's my Master, he's the King of Kings, he's the Lord of Lords, he's my Savior, Jesus died on the cross for my sin, I see God as Savior, I see him as friend, what a friend we have in Jesus, I see him as a judge, he's coming back to judge the world, and so I need to have my act together provider. Many of you pray to God as provider. That I mean, the Lord's prayer tells us to do as much. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bre bread. Provide for me, Lord. Sustainer, get me through the day. Help me, Lord. Get through my job. Help me sustain me as I homeschool my kids. Come on, somebody. Get me, sustain me as I deal with the mess in the world and the pressures that I feel. Sustain me. Deliver me from temptation. Deliver me from my sin. Deliver me from the troubles that I'm in. Deliver me. Defend me from my enemies. Defend me from my thoughts. Defend me from the enemy. And maybe you just put in the comments, what's the way that you primarily relate to God? And my encouragement today, because I believe the scripture encourages us this, without faith, it is impossible to please God, to, to come to God, to come towards God. You must believe that he exists and he rewards those who diligently seek after him. We're going to talk today about relating to God as a rewarder, as a rewarder. And once again, in the text, for whoever would draw near to God, do you want to draw near to God? Do you want to have a faith that pleases God? If you want to have a faith that is pleasing to God, we must believe he exists check. Hopefully there's a check there. You believe he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Let me just summarize this by saying it this way. It pleases God when we believe God rewards us when we seek him. Man, this seems like one of the easiest ways to please God. Come on, folks. You don't got to do this. You don't got to do that. You just got to believe that he rewards us when we seek him. If we can believe God is a rewarder as we seek him, it will please God. Do you have faith that God is a rewarder? Do you identify with God as a rewarder? If not, what I'm going to do now is to show you a bunch of scriptures. Because remember, faith is giving more weight, making more real eternal truths rather than the things we see and feel. 
So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to introduce you to, to some eternal truths that prayerfully by the end, that this will give more substance to God as a rewarder than maybe some of the other ways in which you relate to God, because this is an important way to relate to God if we want to live by faith. So let's take a look at the first one here in First Chronicles. If you seek him, he'll make sure you find him. He will reward those who diligently seek him. If you seek him, he'll make sure you find him. What's the reward? Him. If you seek him, you will find him. Proverbs says it this way. Solomon writes, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Look at these promises in scripture. When we seek God, we will find him. The Hebrews passage said, if you want to have a faith that pleases God, you must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Seek me diligently and you will find me. Jeremiah, now we all know Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope, plans to give you a future, the most out of context verse ever, right? We love to claim that verse over our lives, even though Jeremiah was talking to the Israelites at that time. So that's 29.11, but look at the couple of verses, 29.13 and 14. We should memorize these verses too. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. This might actually be the message translation. That might have been a typo there. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. If you look for me, you will be rewarded. You'll find me. If you're serious about finding me, you won't be disappointed. As I went through these first couple passages about seeking after the Lord and finding God, I just thought to myself, God does not win in a game of hide and seek. God does not win. It seems like these passages would lead us to believe that we can win every time we play hide and seek with God. Why? Because when we seek after him, we find him every single time. You won't be disappointed. When you come looking for me, you will find me. You will be rewarded. Well, that's just the Old Testament, Ed. Is there any New Testament passages that speak to the nature of God rewarding those who seek him? Absolutely. You're familiar with this one. Seek the kingdom of God. Above all else, seek ye first the kingdom of God as we learned growing up and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. New Living Translation says it and he will give you everything you need. When you seek the Lord, you will be rewarded. Everything you need, he will give you. Last one, Matthew 7, 7, both of these passages are in the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew 7, 7, another verse that you're super familiar with. Ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So I just wanna stop for a minute and I want you to recall the ways in which in your life, many of you Christians watching, the times when you've sought after God and he rewarded you. Let's just talk about the fast for a second, come on. Many of you participated in the fast and in this fast you were seeking after God you were seeking after answers. You were seeking after clarity. You were seeking after strength. I know for myself, I was seeking for God to do supernatural things. I was seeking for supernatural wisdom in regards to how to lead our church. And as I sought the Lord by faith, 
He, re he rewarded me. He rewarded me with, with insight about speaking into the political climate, giving me that passage uh, with Peter. And when Peter basically does it his own way and God showed me, he helped me see that Peter was us. And that sometimes we can get in the way of God's will by doing it our way. God rewarded me by speaking to me. As I've sought God on your behalf, God rewarded me. And as I've done these shepherding calls, I have heard stories of people in our church who at one time were very, very worried, no longer experiencing anxiety. For people who... who who were hating one another, for people who had issues with people in the church. I heard stories of reconciliation. I saw people who were at odds with each other reconcile, forgive, have honest conversations. I've seen God reward me as I've sought him. And I think if you think about it long and hard enough, you would know, wow, there are times when I've moved towards God that he's moved towards me. He's rewarded me with, with a job. He's rewarded me with insight. He's rewarded me with a paradigm shift in my thinking. As I have sought God, he has rewarded me. And if he's been faithful to reward you as you've sought him, should we not relate to our God, not just as king, not just as Lord, not just as savior, but my God is a rewarder. He's a rewarder. And how rewarding could it be? How encouraging could it be if, in addition to all the other ways we look at God, we saw him as a rewarder? Now, let me just break this down for you. I'm going to get ready to close here. But maybe some of you would say, well, I'm not feeling the rewards of God. I'm not experiencing the rewards of God. And so let me put up our chart that we've been using to help us believe the eternal truths more than the things we see and feel. What's real? I'm not currently experiencing the rewards of God. The way my marriage is going, the way my parenting is going, the fact that I haven't gotten married yet, the fact that my financial situation is, is still the way that it is, I'm not currently experiencing the rewards of God. And for you, that, that could be real. Now, I would say this. Look a little harder. Look a little harder. You might not be feeling or seeing the rewards of God in the way that you want to see the rewards of God. But I think if we all took enough time to take some inventory of the blessings and the rewards of God, we, we might find something. But let's just say worst case scenario, God really isn't rewarding you right now. You really are seeking him, but he really isn't rewarding you. Faith makes this more real. If I keep seeking God, I will be rewarded. If I keep seeking God, I will be rewarded. I felt like today the message that God wanted me to share with many of you was to keep seeking God. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. I know you're tired. I know you're tired of praying the same prayers over and over and over again. I know you believe like he's not listening to you, but what does the scripture say? Don't just go off what you feel and what you see. The scripture says, if you seek me, you will find me. The scripture said, God rewards those who diligently seek after him. The scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And if and when you do, all these things will be added unto you. Unto you. Everything you need for a life of godliness will be added unto you. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And God will answer, God will open, God will respond. If you're tired today, if you're weary today from seeking after God, Ed, you don't understand, I'm showing up to small group, I'm doing all the things, I'm opening up my Bible and I just don't feel the reward of God. Persevere, continue, why? Because 
It's a promise. God rewards those who diligently seek after him. So here's what I want to do as I close. I want to give you three simple applications. Three simple applications to this message. And after that, I want to close with the story. I want to close with a Bible story that many of us are familiar with, but I believe it's going to tie it all up together and it's going to show us the gospel in a beautiful way. And so first, let's look at the applications. If you don't just want to be a hearer of the word, but you want to be a doer of the word, here are three ways I want to encourage you to persevere in seeking after God. Number one, keep seeking God in the scriptures. I've been there, friends. Bible reading can be dry. Come on, somebody. You're just looking it over. Nothing's popping out of the page. Nothing's feeling like it makes sense to you. It seems like old time language that it's not helpful to me at all. I understand the challenge that Bible reading can be. I would just encourage you, keep seeking God in the scriptures. The word says about the word that it's like a two-edged sword. It's sharp, cutting through bone and marrow, revealing the hearts of man. Keep seeking God in the scriptures. Number two, keep seeking God in prayer, friends. If there's ever a time where we needed to pray and we needed to seek God in prayer for our lives, for our church, for our country, it's now. And we will continue to have Monday night prayer meetings. We did a three-week run during the 21-day fast. And now we're going to do another eight weeks parallel to this series. And we'll take a break on the prayer meetings on Monday nights uh, starting in December. But we're going to run these all the way through November as we go through this teaching series. And I just want to encourage you, keep seeking God in prayer. Show up to the prayer meeting once every couple of weeks, at least once a month. Make it a goal. Show up to the prayer meeting. Keep seeking God in prayer. And one other thing about prayer. For those of you who would like to join, for those of you who benefited from the 21-day fast, what we're going to do around here, I know I'm going to do this. I'm leading our staff to do this. And for anyone who would want to join in, we, we used to call it back in the day, Movement Mondays. Movement Mondays. And what's Movement Mondays? That's a day where we fast and we pray. And so what I'm going to do on Mondays is I'm going to drink water only throughout the day. You could do liquid only, whatever you want. And I'm going to break my fast after the prayer meeting on Monday nights. Would some of you consider joining me on Mondays to seek God in prayer, to seek his face, to call on him to worship him in prayer, to petition him in prayer as an act of worship. Keep seeking God in prayer. And thirdly, as the body of Christ, all having a part to play, keep seeking God in community. I'm so thankful that this past week there were many new people who joined our groups. Give it up for the new people who join groups. Praise God that new people are seeking out community. And I just want to talk to the maybe five, six, seven people, three people that may be on the fringes and have yet to join a group. Join this week the link. I'm going to ask Owen or whoever's uh, helping us today. Put that link in and sign up for a group. It's by Zoom. It's an hour short. It moves fast. We get to know each other over an icebreaker. We talk about the message and we pray. We seek God in community. We seek God in the scriptures by talking about the message. And we seek God at the end in prayer. And we do it all in community. For those of you who've yet to take that step, you've been watching messages every single week but you have no biblical community around you, I would encourage you, don't try to do this stuff alone. Click on that link in the chat. It'll take you to our groups page. And there's various groups meeting throughout the week. Seek God in the scriptures. Seek God in prayer. Seek God in community. Now, 
as I land this plane here, lest we leave this message today thinking that it's more about us seeking God and what we have to do. I would hate this to be a self-help message where, okay, if you want to live by faith and if you want to live a life that pleases God, seek God in all these ways. Yes, that's true, but I want to actually show you through a story something more true. Peep this. It's real that when we seek God, God will reward us. That's real. When we seek God, he will reward us. But there's something more real. There's something more real that when we seek God, he will reward us. I think it's good for our faith. I think it's something we need to put in our back pocket. I think we need to start seeing God as a rewarder. How much joy, how much more joy could we live in if we saw God not only as king, as Lord, as savior, as provider, but as rewarder. That gets me amped. I want to serve God. I want to seek God because I can't wait to see how he rewards me next. As beautiful as that is, there's something more real. And let me show you that through the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man. And I know some of the kids back home, you've liked the fact that I've, I've sung every now and then. And growing up, I learned a song about Zacchaeus, and if you know it, parents, come on, some of you know it. For those of you who didn't grow up in church, it's like, yeah, you guys are weird, but that's okay. If you know it, sing along. Here we go. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. All right. So anyways, um, that's the song about Zacchaeus. Uh, I have dreams of being a worship leader one day. Uh, I'm still hoping. Okay, let's jump into... I mean, really, the text is the song, but we'll read it anyways. But, but peep this. I'm about to show you something better than my song. I'm about to show you something better than the fact that God is a rewarder. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He stole from people. He was a tax collector. He was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on the account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So I didn't say he was a wee little man because I'm trying to be mean. I'm saying he's a wee little man because Luke told us he was a small guy. Let's keep moving on. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Let me just pause for a second. Sometimes seeking God is going to be inconvenient. Sometimes seeking God is going to require some work. Sometimes seeking God is going to make you feel uncomfortable. Some of you aren't seeking God because it's uncomfortable for you to climb up and to act in a way that's not how you usually act. To climb up and, and actually maybe put yourself in danger as you seek after God. He climbed up in a tree for he was about to pass that way. It goes on to say, and when Jesus came to the place... He looked up and he said to him, look at the passages of Old Testament and New Testament come alive. If you diligently seek him, if you walk after him, he will reward you. Look, Jesus saw him. He said, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house as Zacchaeus sought Jesus. Jesus rewarded him with his presence. If you seek me, you will find me. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And look what happens. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Let me just tell you, when you seek after God, you're going to have some haters. When you seek after God, there's going to be some naysayers who say, since when did you start seeking after God? Since when did you start taking this Christianity thing seriously? Hating on the fact that God is meeting with you. 
And that's what happened to Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. This is crazy. I mean, Luke doesn't even record Jesus asking Zacchaeus to make these changes. But see, when you get into the presence of God, come on, somebody, you change. You live counterculturally. You forgive. You give back what you owe. You apologize. You live differently when you seek after God and you get into the presence of God. Let me just tell you, church family, if you do not find yourself living differently, you may not be in the presence of God. Because when you get into the presence of God Almighty, things change and they change for the better. Now, that was just a little digression on kind of what happens when you seek after God. This was a great object lesson. When you seek after God, you will find him and he will reward you. But here's the bigger truth I wanted to share with you today. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this. He was rewarded with salvation. Ultimately, that's what happens when we seek after God. We're rewarded with salvation. Salvation has come to this house since he is also a son. He also is a son of Abraham. But peep this. For the son of man, for Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. For Jesus came, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Yes, God rewards those who diligently seek after Him. But more important than our seeking after God is God seeking after us. More important than you seeking after God in prayer. More important than you seeking after God in community. More important than you seeking after God in the scriptures. Let me just tell you this, friend, and I hope it blesses you, that God is seeking after you. And the only reason why we even seek after God is because while we were yet sinners, Christ died God is seeking you before you ever have any unction to seek him at all. And how many of you in the comments would say, thank you, Lord, for seeking me first. The scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. I would say Jesus seeks us. Then we seek first the kingdom of God. Why? Because that's why he came to seek and to save the lost. When you struggle with seeking after God, when you don't see God as a rewarder and so you don't seek after him, the good news is, friend, over 2,000 years ago, God did something to seek after you. He sent Jesus. And to this day, what does the word say? Behold, revelation, I stand at the door and knock. Let's not only be encouraged by the fact that God is a rewarder, that he rewards those who diligently seek after him, but let's even be more encouraged. What's more real than God is rewarded than those who seek after him? What's more real is he will seek after us even when we're not seeking after him. What an act of grace. And my prayer for you is that, yes, seek after God, but also when you fail to do so, Remember, he's seeking after you and he will find you because that's what he does. Would you bow your heads with me and let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, help us to have the type of faith that pleases you. Help us to have the faith that pleases you by believing that you exist and believing that you reward those who seek after you. Help us to have that faith. Lord, I do. I, I hope you would convict our hearts to seek you in the scriptures, to seek you in prayer, to seek you in community. And, 
And it's not bad to be motivated and to be looking forward to the fact that you'll reward us. I, I love the rewards that I've experienced in seeking after you. But help us to be overcome. Help us to be in awe of before Zacchaeus ever climbed that tree. Before we ever made any steps towards you. Praise you, God, that you were making steps towards us. Like the prodigal son coming home, you as the father, you run out to greet us. You are looking on the horizon for us to come back home and to find ourselves in you, God. It's less about my seeking after you and more about your perfect, persistent seeking after me. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Help that overflow in us into worship. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.